Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the fifth session. Uh, the paper we will hear about is the tail that wags the economy, not the dog, belief in persistent uh, stagnation. Now, the paper will be presented by Laura Weltkamp. Uh, she is professor of economics at Stern School of Business in New York, and she is co-editor of the journal of Economic Theory. She is a PhD from uh, Stanford, and uh, she has a long CV, uh, which I cannot read now. But uh, her research focuses on how individual investors and firms get their information, and how that information leads to action, and how this action then affects the macroeconomy and asset prices. So, and her recent work has been especially how people form beliefs about tail risks and tail. Sounds familiar, comes in a moment. And uh, how uh, try to explain persistent low interest rates, volatile equity prices, and secular stagnation. And that's exactly what her paper will be about. Uh, I did some research to find where the tail wagging the dog comes from. So that is already an old old saying, an expression probably originating in the US, I heard. Uh, there is no specific incident that refers to that, where it can be located. Uh, but uh, up from the 1870s, and the first quote uh, they found is in 1872, where this was actually used in the Daily Republican, referring to a Cincinnati Convention of the Democrats, where they say this convention, it would be like uh, the tail wagging the uh, dog. But what we hear now is how the tail wags the economy, and so 30 minutes for Laura, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to present this paper. So this is joint work with Jolian Kozlowski, an NYU student. He's on the job market this year. And my colleague, Venki Venkat, as well. So the question we're after is, why was the Great Recession why did it seem to have persistent effects, more persistent than other recessions we've seen? So we've all seen this figure before, GDP, we've got that trend, it dropped in the financial crisis, and there's this gap. So we're talking about a level shift, what looks like a permanent level shift now. And we're gonna argue that it was a tail event that caused a large change in beliefs that had persistent effects. So what do we have in mind? Well, imagine back in 2006, and I come up here and tell you bank runs will reappear in the modern economy. Oh, God, I hate being stuck behind these things. OK, I'll try. Um, bank runs will reemerge in the modern economy. And I come up here at the ECB research conference, and you laugh me out of the room. You say, that's ridiculous. We haven't seen bank runs since the Great Depression. We have much better banking regulation. There's no chance that we're going to have bank runs in developed modern economies. If you come up here now and you say, we're prone to bank runs again, everybody says, oh, we're working on that problem. And every day in the newspaper, you hear something about financial stability. And we have whole teams of researchers worrying about financial stability. That is a real concern in the minds of market participants that financial collapse in the US, in Europe, is a, is a non-zero, maybe not highly likely, but non-zero probability. We really did change our minds. Economists, academic economists, changed what we worked on afterwards. We had this prior that banking, for most of us, seemed kind of a little boring. There's not a lot of big questions in there, a lot of modern research. There are some great exceptions in the room. But now we're all talking about financial stability, financial interconnectedness, about macro finance, and connections between the real and financial economy. We saw something that made us change our minds. There were some prescient uh, agents out there who knew what was happening, but most of us were not among them. Okay, so when you change your mind, you now have different beliefs. And the fact that we've seen the economy brought to the precipice of a financial crisis is a piece of information that we will carry in our minds for the rest of our lives. The event itself may have been transitory, but we observed some data that will be in our data set for many years to come. That's the source of persistence in this model. Okay, so main mechanism is we're going to argue nobody knows the true distribution of aggregate shocks in the economy. We, our models usually say we do, we pretend we do, but in truth we have to estimate it just like an econometrician would do. So people are going to estimate this distribution and they're going to re-estimate it as new data arrives. So we have estimation of beliefs as a key novel feature of the model. How is that going to work? Well, the agents, 
are going to use macro data. So we, as economists, as econometricians, are going to use macro data as well. We're going to feed actual macro data into this model and ask the model, how should the agent's beliefs change? So yes, this is a paper about beliefs, but it's also empirically disciplined measurement of beliefs. So we're going to do this in a non-parametric way because, well, if we don't, you say, how do you know it's normal? Or how did you know it was log normal? How did you know it was left skewed in that way? So we're going to use a non-parametric approach. It's really flexible. It avoids distributional assumptions. It allows us to think about what specifically is the role of tail risk. And that's a very difficult question to ask when you stick some functional forms on your distribution, especially normals, which basically don't have anything going on in the tails. So we're going to use this, this flexible, flexible non-parametric form. So the tail event, which in this case is the Great Recession, causes a particularly large change in beliefs. So any data you've seen is going to cause you to re-estimate your distribution. So in principle, every piece of data we see should have some transitory effect. But what's important about tail events is that we don't see them very often. So yes, I see something near the mean, and I re-estimate the distribution, but I've seen lots of events near the mean. So when I re-estimate, I really don't adjust very much because I've got a big data set there. Tail events, by their very nature, are things we see very infrequently. So when we happen to see a new tail event arise, it's very informative, and it causes our beliefs to change by more. So that's why those events in particular are important in this model. So they'll cause changes in tail probabilities. The beliefs here are martingales. So there'll be a permanent change from IID shocks. Most beliefs are martingales. If they weren't, we would adjust. If we think that tomorrow we will have a more optimistic belief about the world, we should probably have better optimism, more optimism today. Right? That's the nature of beliefs as martingales. So we're going to stick this mechanism in a really standard economic framework. We're just going to lift somebody else's macroeconomic model and ask what happens if the agents don't know the distribution and they, they estimate it given realized data. And we'll show this is quantitatively successful in explaining the persistent decline in output we saw and that it's consistent with some financial market data and popular narratives as well. Okay, so I'm gonna talk first about the belief formation part because that's the new piece in this paper. Then I'll show you the economic environment where we embed that. Then we'll talk about some quantitative results, model and data, and, and I'll briefly mention some analysis and robustness that's in the paper. Okay, belief formation. So we're going to have an IID shock that drives the model. Why do we want the shock to be IID? Because I don't want to hardwire any persistence in the model, and persistence is what I'm trying to explain. That's going to be called phi, and it's going to have some distribution. This is a probability density function, g. Your information set is a finite history. It's important that it's finite. It can be big because tail events are observed rarely. Big is fine, but it can't be infinite. Okay? With infinite data, we would know the true distribution. So you've got this finite history of shock realizations. We want this flexible specification so that we can think about how big the tails are with respect to the rest of the distribution. So we're going to use a non-parametric estimator. So this is a Gaussian kernel density. This is what it looks like. So the uh, estimated distribution, g, g hat here, is basically what it does is every time you see a new piece of data, this, uh, what a Gaussian kernel estimator will do is it drops a little normal PDF around the data point you observed. Okay? So sums of normal variables are distributed normally. Sums of normal probability density functions are not normal probability density functions, right? You can't add up exponentials and get an exponential. So we get little probability density normal distributions around every data point we've seen, but if we've seen a whole bunch of data out here, we'll have a big hump and we could have something bimodal and so forth, okay? So it gives you this very flexible, and if you open up a textbook and you say what's the most common way to estimate a distribution non-parametrically, you're gonna come up with this. And if we, we tried some different uh, alternatives, things like, uh, you know, box and things that allow for estimation of long tails. It doesn't matter very much exactly which one we use, so we're using the most common one. So this is how agents are going to form beliefs. They're going to believe that the distribution is the normal kernel density estimator given all the data they'd observed. And basically what it amounts to is take everything you've seen, put it in a histogram, and draw a smooth line over the histogram. And this is just a particular way of drawing that smooth line over the histogram of everything you've ever seen. So in this world, beliefs are almost martingales. Not exactly martingales because of exactly the way this thing is constructed, but numerically up to a high degree of approximation. You expect your beliefs tomorrow to be what they are today. 
Okay, so here's an example of just using this belief formation process. I'm just gonna take some data in and show you what it looks like. So I'm gonna take some capital return data. Why? It turns out that that looks kind of like the shocks on our model, but right now this is just some data on capital returns. It could be anything right now. And show you what the estimated beliefs look like. So here's the time series of capital returns in the left panel. The estimated beliefs up to 2007, so that's before that really large drop on the right side, that's 2008, 2009. So really just before that large drop, our distribution looks like the line in blue. Now I put in the additional data from 2008 and 2009, and then the distribution, the non-parametric kernel density, looks like the line in red. They're not wildly different, but we now have this little hump out to the left. That's the additional tail risk that you believe is there in 2009 that you didn't estimate to be there in 2007. And if we now draw from the distribution of capital returns in 2009, and we draw, uh, we simulate out a whole bunch of future paths up through 2030, 2039, and we say for each one of those paths, now let's estimate a 2039 distribution, you get a distribution over distributions, right? Because every one of these future paths will give you a different 2039 distribution. That distribution of distributions is what's in blue. That's the two standard deviation interval around, and notice that it's mean is today's distribution. It is the red dotted line. That lies right in the middle of that. That's the sense in which beliefs are martingales. So I know in 2039, I'm likely to have a different distribution today. It's gonna be something in that blue range, but on average, what I'll believe in 2039 lies on my beliefs today. I don't expect to systematically be more optimistic or more pessimistic around the world. That's that blue interval lying around the uh, red line. So that's, the, that's kind of how beliefs are working. They're very persistent. Notice that even out in 2039, there's still a hump on the left. And most of these um, sequences that I'm drawing, I still see that elevated tail risk from that tail event that I observed in 2008 and 2009. So tail risk here is persistent because once I've seen it, it's in my data set, it's in my histogram. And even as I keep adding more data, that tail risk, that tail event is still here. So when I draw that smooth line over my histogram to estimate my beliefs, I still have that data telling me that these extreme events are possible. Okay, so now we're gonna take that belief formation process, that let's take all the data we've ever seen and estimate a distribution and stick it in a model where agents are doing that and taking actions based on their estimates of what's going on in the world and what's possible. Okay, so this model is taken from work by Francois Guriot, his 2012 AER paper and a follow-up paper in 2013. So he's got a Cobb Douglas production economy. The output is produced with capital and labor. Then he's got aggregate shocks to capital quality. Okay, so these are not our standard TFP shocks. They're, they have some similarities. Why does he use that capital quality shock? In particular, because it allows us to uh, reconcile real outcomes with financial outcomes. Okay? It's gonna allow us to do that in a way that TFP doesn't. That distribution of capital quality shocks, G, is what's unknown to the agent. So they don't know how likely high or low capital quality shocks are, and they estimate it given the observed data. So that gives rise to a law of motion for capital. Uh, tomorrow's capital is today's capital minus depreciation plus some investment. And then their credit and labor markets. So firms are gonna borrow with one period defaultable debt, as in Eaton and Gertzovitz. Labor is hired in advance, so before observing shocks. So we agree on some labor contracts before we know what our capital quality shocks are, and that gives rise to a form of operating leverage. The idiosyncratic shocks of firms, across firms, give rise to some positive default in equilibrium. There's some firms that get whacked by a negative shock and then can't meet their debt and labor market obligations. Preferences, there'll be a representative household with Epstein's in preferences over consumption and leisure, so consumption minus labor. And then that's all standard. That's all in Francois's work. We're not adding anything to that. The new piece here is beliefs where the distribution G is unknown to all agents. At each date, everybody observes a new capital quality shock, a new one of these fees, and then they use that Gaussian kernel density estimator to estimate a new distribution of future capital quality shocks. And they use that estimated distribution, that is their beliefs, and on the basis of that, they make new capital and labor decisions going forward. 
So what happens? First, let me tell you how do we estimate the aggregate capital quality shock. So what that thing is, is it's your effective capital divided by yesterday's capital and your investment. So capital quality shock, it's kind of as if you built this big hotel in Las Vegas, and now the top 10 floors are empty, and so nature kind of whacked off the top 10 floors. So your ca effective capital is everything below the top 10 floors that's actually occupied, and the top, it's as if the top 10 went away. Okay, so that's your effective capital. Yesterday's capital is the whole building, because that's what you invested in. So how are we gonna try to measure this? Well, we're gonna look at non-financial assets from the flow of funds, Commercial real estate is about 55% of that. A bunch is equipment and software. And then we look at the replacement cost of that. And that's our effective capital. How much would it cost you to rebuild the whole, the whole hotel? And the historical cost gives us the investment. So we use that to map into, we just construct a sequence of effective capital quality shocks. And it's more or less how much is it worth today divided by how much was it worth yesterday. So we calibrate the model. We have risk aversion of 10. IES of two, Frisch elasticity of two, we target a leverage of, of 0.5 and a default rate of 2%, which were empirically relevant at that time. Okay, so here's our capital quality shock that we've estimated given these estimates of, of capital values today and yesterday. And this is what our shock series looks like. So from 1950 to 1990, there's not a lot of action in this. It moves up and down. It gets a little more volatile in the 2000s, and then you can see those big drops at the time of the financial crisis, and they're enormous outliers in this distribution. So when we estimate what's the distribution of this, this is essentially like what's the histogram of that time series you're looking at. That's what that blue line, 2007, is what's the histogram up until 2007, just before it plummets. 2009, the red dashed line is, what's the histogram of this data? after we saw the financial crisis, after it plummeted. And you can see there are really two points at which there's additional data. Sorry, I'll come back to the microphone. One, two, okay? So this is annual data, and those are our two additional data points that are showing up that were nearly zero probability before the financial crisis and that we now place pro positive probability on, okay? So we saw this large negative shock, that data is now in our data set. It's going to give a rise to, I don't know, large. They look small relative to all the other data. They're still rare, right? But they're going to have an important role to play in the model. The fact that you know now you might get 15% of your capital whacked is going to make a big difference in how agents in this economy behave. OK, so what do we do with the model now? Well, we're going to start at a steady state of 2007. So we're going to estimate that kernel from 1950 to 2007 and give our agents that 2007 you know, histogram, those 2007 beliefs. Then we're going to feed in the actual fee shocks, the actual capital quality shocks from 2008 to 2009, and re-estimate that kernel. And then we give them 2009. And then we look at how does this economy adjust. So this is all about this transition path. So then we're gonna, we want to show you that this is persistent. We can't stop at 2009 and talk about persistence. That's not terribly persistent. At the same time, we don't really know what the future, we know what data now through today looks like, but we'd like to show you that it's persistent for many decades to come. So we're going to draw data from the future. We're going to draw sequences of future realizations from the 2009 distribution. We're going to draw a whole bunch of those sequences and then show you what the average looks like. Okay, so this is an average of future outcomes given different draws of future paths from that estimated distribution. So we'll compute updated beliefs, aggregate capital, output, labor along each path, and we plot the mean of the future paths of all these aggregates. Okay. So here's what the capital quality shock looks like, where zero is just average, so we start at zero. That's just a normalization. We get one, two negative capital quality shocks. It might look like one, but there are actually two data points in there on the way down. And then it goes back to zero. Does that mean there are no more shocks in the model? No. There are a whole bunch of different paths we're drawing. On average, the future shocks are zero because the mean of the capital quality distribution is normalized to be zero. But there are a whole bunch of different paths, some of which are giving good paths of capital quality shocks and some of which are bad. Okay. So GDP falls and then it just stays low. And it's 12% below the pre-crisis mean. Why is it staying low? Because knowing now that there's this possibility that 15% of your capital stock's gonna get whacked off, agents are investing less, they're hiring less, the firms delever, 
and there's less economic activity. Investment falls, it recovers a little bit, and labor falls. What does this look like relative to the data? GDP, we essentially get the right amount of decline in GDP without using it as a calibration target. Investment, we undershoot a lot. Why? Because the model just whacked off a whole bunch of your capital. And so the incentive at that point, if you just lost 15% of your hotel, would be to invest like crazy to rebuild it because you just whacked off a whole bunch of capital. So there's a very strong incentive to reinvest here that the negative beliefs are fighting and they're counteracting and they're getting negative investment, but we have to fight against this force that's inherent in these models of capital quality shocks. That's kind of the underlying structure we're using. And labor, we undershoot a little bit, but more recently, it looks more like the data. So there's some, there's some mixed evidence here, but there's certainly some persistence. Okay. I don't have time to talk about all the things that we do in the paper to satisfy the many referees that have now seen this, including turning off, uh, well, I'll talk to you about turning off belief updating and some evidence from asset markets. I will not have time to talk to you about what if there were no more financial crises, the shock size and persistence. We show that uh, small shocks generate some persistence, but it's really negligible. Why? Because you've got tons of data near the mean of the distribution. So when little things happen, yeah, they have persistent effects, but they're awfully small compared to the transitory ones. What if the learning sample included pre-1950 data? We construct something that kind of looks like this data pre-1950 and make use of that, including the Great Depression. Mean, risk, and debt are all important for long-run effects, and they have different magnitudes of importance. We break all that out. And shoot, including shock realizations post-2009 doesn't materially change the results. We talk about what's the role of Epstein's in preferences. Why is that there? Why is risk aversion there? Why is the intertemporal elasticity of substitution? What it is, how sensitive it is to that? The shorter answer is you need a bunch of curvature in this model. A model that's like a standard real business cycle model is almost linear. And so small probabilities out in the tails don't do very much in that model. What makes this model particularly useful for thinking about tail risk is that there's some nonlinearity away from the mean that makes stuff far away from the mean have a particularly large effect. What's the role of GHH preferences, uh, exogenous persistence in the capital quality shocks? We can add that. Unsurprisingly, it makes the outcomes more persistent. Uh, learning with a normal distribution instead of the kernel density, that doesn't do a whole lot because the tails don't move, and then some additional steady state analysis. All that's in the paper. Okay, so I want to focus, though, on a couple of exercises we do in the time I have left. Number one is, what's the role of belief changes? So what if agents knew the true distribution, we call truth the 2009 distribution, knowing that financial crises are possible, what if they knew that from the start? Right? That's kind of like the rational expectations assumption. Agents know the true data generating process. So we feed in the same set of capital quality shocks, that's the same shock process I showed you before. Now we've got our model in blue, that's the same result I showed you before, the data in red, and in green is what would happen with no learning. No learning means you knew before any of this happened that there is tail risk. You knew that there was a possibility, a non-zero possibility, that 15% of your capital stock wasn't gonna get whacked. If that was the case, if that were the case, you would have a decline in GDP. The capital quality shock itself, by whacking a bunch of your capital, causes a decline in output, and it's about right magnitude. Okay? So the capital quality shocks are giving you the size of the initial decline. That's why we get the right initial decline size. It has nothing to do with learning. It's the right size shock for the right size outcome. But without learning, if you knew the truth, you would then return to your steady state level. Okay? Your steady state level here is normalized to zero. You'd actually be returning to the blue line. You would start lower and you would return lower. With the model, you get persistence. The investment would look qualitatively very different. I explained to you before, if you just have a capital quality shock and no learning, what do you want to do? You want to invest like crazy because a bunch of your capital was just blown up and you want to rebuild. So without learning, that green line for investment shoots up and we get a big investment surge in the time of the financial crisis. The model gets it to come down. Why? Because, well, yeah, you lost a bunch of capital, but you're also really scared that your capital might get blown away again, just like it did in the financial crisis. And that fear that of tail risk is what keeps you from increasing investment. And then labor falls. 
again, the magnitude is similar with and without learning, but if you didn't have that new knowledge, if we'd known beforehand that the financial system was on the brink of financial collapse, yes, the financial crisis would have done something to G GDP, but that effect would have been transitory. We would then rebuild and go back to our original steady state rather quickly, like you would in a standard business cycle model. Here, it is the fact that we now know that financial crises are happening in the future, and we didn't before, that makes us behave systematically differently today and in a persistent way than what we did before. So if there are no belief revisions, you get declines. Okay, The success of the model is not getting the right size decline. The success of the model is getting that decline to persist, to look like that level shift that's what we see in the data. Okay, so evidence from asset markets. What are some good indicators of tail risk in asset markets? Option prices. So we're gonna show you two option price uh, measures that tell us something about what are the probability of tail events. So there's a skew index, which is essentially the third moment. It's trying to measure skewness. It's, a, it's produced by the same people who produce the VIX, they produce the skew. In the model, we can construct there are, we can price assets in this model, we can price shares of capital in this model, and we can then construct moments of those asset prices of the, the capital stock price in the model. And so out of the model, we get a third moment, we get a skew index that drops by 0.27% after the financial crisis. So this is a difference between what we saw in before and after. In the data, this is the 2005-2007 average relative to the 2013-2015 average. In the model, it's just 2007 before we saw these tail events and, and after 2009. So in the, in the model, it dropped 0.27%. In the data, we get negative 0.28. Tail risk looks a little less similar, but we can price out what's the probability of a negative two standard deviation event. And that rose in the model, 1.5% and 2.23 in the data. So both of these look like there's more tail risk being priced into assets now. There's more skewness and more probability of extreme events, and that's consistent with what we would get out of the similar prices in the model. Okay? For the no learning model, if we gave everybody prior knowledge that financial crises are possible, not that they would happen for sure, but they, they were possible, there would be no change in either of these. Because we'd see the financial crisis and we'd say, yeah, but we knew all along that could happen. Right? And I haven't updated my probability that it'll happen that way tomorrow, so I'm going to have the same risk premia for those events. Okay. So, conclusion. Nobody knows the true distribution of shocks. We pretend we do in our models, and for, actually for most events, this actually tells us that's not a bad assumption. Right? If we didn't see those two tail events, our agents who estimate these kernel densities and our standard rational expectations agent who knows the true data generating process of the economy are going to behave almost the same. Okay? So most of the time, this theory tells us rational expectations is great. It makes our lives a lot simpler and it does a pretty good job. But it's exactly in times when we see events for which we have very little data. Kind of like John's theory told us that we should worry about rational inattention in situations where we don't make choices very often, but when we go out to dinner, we probably know what we're doing. The same thing's going on here for the macroeconomy. We know what we're doing with one standard deviation shocks. But when we see something that's unlike anything that we've seen in a couple generations, we don't really know what the probability of that is. And so when we see it, we update. So new data permanently reshapes our assessment of macro risks. Might that affect decline in a very long time? Yes, if we don't see any more financial crises. Right? But if we're drawing from the 2009 distribution, which has a probability of financial crises that says once every 80 years we're going to see something like this, then in the future, chances are we're going to see another financial crisis someday, and that tail risk will stay there forever. It'll diminish and then rise when we see one of these things again, and diminish and rise when we see one of these things again. So this gives us a new perspective on the current prolonged stagnation. And I think more generally, we're missing persistence in a lot of aggregate models. We have to hardwire in persistent aggregate shocks that don't seem that compatible with directly measuring them from the data. And so we're missing endogenous propagation mechanisms in a lot of our models. And this is a very simple way. Computing this, this is a tough model to compute, but that's because Francois's model is a tough model to compute. 
The additional piece that we added on is microseconds to compute. It's one line of code. Kernel KS in MATLAB, and you get out this distribution given your observed, your observed set of shots. It's a very simple tool to add to you know, macro models, whether they be computationally intensive or very simple, that we can embed in our quantitative macro models to generate additional persistence. Staying exactly in time, uh, it must have been pretty hard for you that you couldn't move around. Sorry for <laughs> not having a microphone, having seen you on YouTube. We know you want to move around, but thanks uh, for staying in time. So now uh, for the discussant, uh, we have uh, Alberto Martin. Uh, Alberto is uh, from the Centre de Ricerca. Cerza in Economia Internacional. Sorry for my Catalan; it's not 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 very good. Um, he is, uh, his education is a PhD from Columbia University, and uh, before uh, he studied in in Argentina, and he has been also uh, visiting at INSEAD, at the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis University, Bologna, and also at the, he was before also at the International Monetary Fund. So, uh, Alberto, you have 15 minutes to. Yeah, to tell us about persistence and tails and... Uh, Thank you. Could you put the slides up, please? Uh, okay, so while they put the slides up, let me thank the organizers for having me. It's a great paper to read. Let me tell you that, you know, more than half of a great discussion is a confusing paper. A confused paper is even better. This makes the discussion's uh, life very easy. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not the case. Okay, so it's a paper that's very well polished, very well written. It's very simple um, um, to read. It has a lot of subtleties, but it's uh, very easy to understand what they're up to. So having said that, I'm going to have a very simple discussion. Okay, so let me tell you not what this paper is about, because you just heard it from Laura very clear. The, uh, the question that they ask is very simple. Why has the recovery from the 2008-9 crisis been so slow? Why has stagnation uh, been persistent? Now, of course, you could say, well, maybe there was a persistent shock underlying that makes the exit from this crisis slow. Maybe we had a temporary shock with some amplification mechanism. You know, there's these models of uncertainty. We get a negative shock. We become uncertain. So we invest less. So then output is slow, and this feeds uncertainty, etc. Here, what they do is they say, look, we don't know the true distribution of shocks, um, and the crisis is a low probability event. It's a tail event. So what happens? Two things happen. First of all, we draw the crisis. It's a very unlikely event, so we were not prepared for it. You know, we have non-contingent debt, uh, non-contingent wages, etc. so the shock hits the economy very strongly. Moreover, now we know that it can happen going forward. We um, review, recalculate the distribution of uh, shocks, and so this affects our beliefs potentially in a very uh, persistent uh, manner. Okay, so in particular, you know, the core of the model, they, they embedded into the model of Francois Gouriot, but you could put this in any model to generate persistence. So it's a very uh, neat tool. Basically, belief formation is done through non-parametric estimation, so they don't impose a particular distribution, but basically what happens here is that you draw the shock, and then given all the history of observations, you approximate a distribution with a... Um, um, with a smooth uh, histogram. Okay, so in particular, what this delivers is that even if the shock is IID, as in their case, every time I uh, draw a shock, I re-estimate the distribution, but the distribution itself is a martingale. What this means is that my best guess for the distribution next period is the distribution that I estimated today. Okay, so you can see how this works. We draw an extreme event today that we thought was very unlikely. We revise our expectations upward, maybe slightly, but now our whole distribution, expected distribution going forward, inherits this property, and so it's gonna affect investment decisions and, and whatever, okay? So I'll give you my rendition of a, uh, you know, a very simple way to understand this. It's much simpler than what they do because here it's parametric, but imagine you have a model where you draw this productivity parameter phi every period, the parameter is IID, and to make things simple, imagine that we all understand that this is a uniform distribution that's a true underlying distribution, okay? Now, at any point in time, given all the past history of observations, we have some estimated bounds on this distribution, what's the lowest realization and the highest possible realization of it. 
Okay, so if you live in this world where we're recalculating the distribution at any point in time, if I draw a new realization that's within the bounds that I had, well, in this simple case, nothing will change. Today, we may have a low productivity, but I don't revise expectations going forward. So if the shock is IID, the effect on the economy is just transitory, has no effect going forward. If we happen to draw a very low shock that is below what we thought was the lowest possible realization, well, now we understand that the distribution is different, our ex expected productivity changes going forward, and this is gonna affect investment, capital accumulation, and so on and so forth, okay? So what they do is very different, but this captures in a nutshell um, uh, the main idea, okay? Transitory shocks have permanent effects on beliefs, okay? So as I said, this is the core, then they embed it in a macro model, in this model by François Guriot that uh, uh, Laura explained. I would say it's fairly standard. It has a lot of features in order to generate asymmetric responses when the economy gets a negative shock. That's fine. Uh, but basically, the key ingredients are households who consume and supply labor. They have Epstein's seen uh, preferences. And then you have firms that are accumulating capital and combining capital with labor to produce the final good. Okay, so they borrow with, through non-contingent debt. They hire labor in advance through non-contingent wages. And then if they get a really big shock, they may need to exit and there's some bankruptcy uh, in the model. So you take this economy. You can see how it works. Well, Francois has done it. And then... Basically, the way you shock it, it's with a shock to the quality of capital, as Laura explained, which is the shock, for instance, used by uh, Gertler and Kiyotaki and others, where basically you wake up, you had 10 units of capital, now you have five, okay? So um, how do they calibrate the shock? They look at the price, uh, at the fall in the price of non-residential capital in 2008 and nine. So this is the exercise for most of the paper. We take the model of Francois Guriot, and now we shock it, and we say, well, what happens in this model if we wake up one day and uh, there's a fall in the price of non-residential capital, okay? So the main takeaway, what I find most convincing about this paper is that if you take this model, you may think whatever you want of the model, you may like it or not, but if you take this model, what they show is that drawing this stale event that you would think may not have long-lasting uh, effects on the economy has actually huge effects and persistent, okay? And in this, the paper is quite convincing. So just to give you a sense of the magnitudes involved, they say the following. Imagine that we shock the model and agents observe a fall in the price of capital like the one we saw in 2008 and 2009, and they interpret this as a fall in the quality of capital. What is the effect? Well, what happens is that right after seeing that shock, when they re-estimate the entire probability distribution, I ask them, how likely do you think that the price of capital falls 10% in one year or the quality of capital falls 10%? Well, before the crisis, the probability was basically zero. After the crisis, that probability goes up to 2.5%, okay? This is just so you get a sense of the belief, um, you know, revision that takes place. Now you may think this is not much. This stale event went from zero to 2.5%. Well, it has huge effects on the steady state magnitudes. Output goes down by 12% uh, and capital by 17%, okay? Now, of course, when they draw these tables, two things are happening. We're changing the entire distribution of the economy. So crises are more likely now, and also agents know that they're more likely. So both effects are taking place. But what I take away and where the paper is quite convincing is that yes, these stale events can have uh, large effects, at least quantitative in this um, calibrated uh, model. Then there's also some contrast with the facts, but let me skip this because I'll come back to it. So it's a very natural idea. We don't know the distribution of uh, things. We see something extreme, we update. I mean, uh, what could be more natural than that? Okay, so I think also it has a lot of potential for many other applications beyond the one they're using. And as I told you, the paper has been around for some time. It's very clean, um, so it's very well executed, and it's very um, easy to read in the, in the best uh, sense. Okay, so the paper is, is very well done, but my discussion is basically gonna um, revolve around two points. The first one is, am I really convinced after reading it and seeing how wonderful it is and so on? The second one is I'm going to raise some conceptual questions about the model that I think are interesting and I would like Laura, I, I would like Laura to tell me uh, what she thinks. Okay, so the first one she uh, commented on. When I'm reading this paper and I'm seeing, well, now the whole belief distribution has changed, agents are very pessimistic, they expect tail events. Well, where do we see this? Where do we see this in data? Okay, do we see it in asset prices? Do we see it in credit? Do we see it in risk? So, uh, for instance, this is my favorite picture uh, in the world. And it's a picture that tells us how the net worth of households has evolved in the US 
over the last 25 years or so. So basically, it's the value of all assets in the US economy divided by GDP, more or less. You can think about it this way. Now, this was about three and a half times GDP up to 1995. And what you see is the sequence of booms and busts in asset prices that we've been experiencing over the last 15 years. 95 to 2000, we had the dot-com boom. We added one GDP of wealth, more or less. Dot-com bust, we lost it. Then we had the housing bubble. We added another GDP and a half of wealth. Then we lost it. And now we've added it. Now we're riding at the highest level ever. Okay, so for those of us who work on bubbles, maybe next time we'll see the crash. And uh, that will be a good thing for some of us. Um, but in general, what I want you to take away from this is that if you look at asset prices in the US today, well, there are a historical high relative to GDP. So in principle, at a first pass, this doesn't look like a uh, you know, very pessimistic environment. Now, there's also the issue of credit. Credit risk spiked during the crisis, then it came down, and they point out in the model, in the model, something very interesting happens. Once we understand that the world is going to be very dangerous going forward, we scale back on leverage. Through an equilibrium, credit risk doesn't rise much because endogenously the level of debt falls. And we see that in the data. On the left-hand panel, you see how business credit, this is one measure of private credit, you could choose others, in fact, scaled down after the crisis and, you know, the private sector has been deleveraging, as we all know. So that's consistent in principle. They say, well, credit risk has come back to normal because the private sector has deleveraged. Now, what has been happening, of course, on the other hand, as you see here, is that that explanation is only half convincing because the public sector has borrowed like crazy. Okay, so in the US, public debt has increased tremendously. And if you look at Euro, at uh, the Eurozone, so here you have public and private debt as a share of GDP for, well, the UK, the Eurozone, et cetera. We see that if you had public and private liabilities, uh, well, there's a lot of debt out there. Okay, and yet credit risk has come down in Europe too. So what has happened? This doesn't seem like very negative uh, outlook either. We piled up a lot of obligations, which we think, you know, if we were so pessimistic about the future, we thought daily events were so likely might make us nervous. And yet, even though these countries have been piling up a lot of debt, we've seen credit spreads go back to pre-crisis levels in many cases. And finally, if you look at volatility, this is just the VIX index. Um, well, it spiked during the crisis, of course, but now it's almost back to pre-crisis levels. Okay? So this may sound like a very negative rendition of their mechanism, but it's not. All I'm saying is that I think what the paper lacks a little bit is to push more the empirical front. Where do we see this evidence? The first things that you can think, think of asset prices, volatility, etc., you don't see. They have good answers for that, huh? by the way. They acknowledge this. They say, look, um, borrowing has gone down, even though when you add public debt, I'm a little bit skeptical. Okay? But then they also say, well, asset prices somehow reflect uh, averages and not necessarily tail events. That could very well be true. Uh, but I think that uh, the paper could benefit from, uh, uh, you know, uh, strengthening a little bit the empirical evidence. At the end, they say, well, let's look at the skew index, which, uh, uh, full disclosure, I didn't know it existed until yesterday when I read the paper. But actually, it's very interesting. It's by the same people that compiled VIX, and it tells us a little bit what is the likelihood, you know, backing out from option prices, what is the likelihood of uh, negative tail events. And so here you have it. Uh, the blue line here is the S&P 500. The red line is basically the skew divided by the VIX. So when that red line is very high, it means that, uh, well, that uh, the likelihood that we attach to a negative tail event relative to the volatility in the stock market is high. Okay? And what we see is that what they claim in the paper is actually right. We're now in a period where the, even though the VIX is very low, the skew index relative to the VIX is high. So there is someone out there who thinks that a tail event it's not completely unlikely. And in fact, when I was trying to research online what this index actually captures, there's actually a pretty heated debate online, investors and so on, what's going on. What they're, you know, the, the view is a little bit that the market as a whole is complacent, but there are some big players or institutional investors that really think a tail event is non-negligible, and so um, they're acting in accordance. Okay? So basically, what I want to conclude from this, uh, from my first point is the following. I think the paper is great in showing that in a quantitative calibrated model, this mechanism can be strong. But if this is so first order to explain stagnation, we should see it in data somewhere. And right now, there's a short discussion in the paper about skew, and I think this could be strengthened somewhat. For instance, survey of forecasters and so on. Another thing that you could mention is that all these asset prices, credit risk, and so on, is after massive policy intervention, which of course distorts um, what these observables as well. The second point I wanted to make is, what, what are we learning about? Maybe there's evidence somewhere else. In the paper, we learn about fundamentals. 
In reality, I think we learn about a lot more than that. We learn about the resilience, the quality of our financial and political system and the resilience. Okay? If you look at the asset price uh, plot that I showed you, the 2001 and 2008 fall in net worth were not that different in magnitude. Okay? They both wiped out about the GDP of uh, asset value, give or take. Okay? But they had very different effects. Why? Well, one story that you could tell is in 2001 with the dot-com bust, the financial system was relatively unscathed. Uh, but this 2008 crisis really was, you know, put the financial system at the heart. So an alternative model that could also encompass your mechanism would be one where in normal times, well, the system works as it's intended to do. It's designed for normal times. But when the crisis hits and we draw a tail event, now we need to really learn, update our beliefs about how resilient and how good our political and uh, financial system is. Okay? Suddenly events that seemed unthinkable, collapse of big banks, you know, dissolution of the Eurozone, God forbid here, uh, populism, etc. all of these events that we've been dealing with since 2008, you know, they rise to the surface. We don't know much about this. They're rare events. We need to learn about them as well. So I had some, you know, you could look at political uncertainty. Um, Luigi Wiso gave me a picture this morning, but I don't have time to talk about it. Let me conclude with this. I have two um, comments. The, the mechanism is very clean, but I have two questions that were not you know, which I'm not entirely sure, and I would like to know Laura's opinion. The first one is this is a world where we know that we don't know the true distribution, but our best estimate of the distribution is the one we estimate today. However, even though the best we can do is um, the distribution that we have today, the fact that we know that we don't know it exactly, does that uncertainty enter anywhere in the model? Does that make us be precautionary in any way, or, or are we do we act as if this were really the true distribution? And I'm not entirely sure how you would go around modeling this, but this seems like an interesting point that I didn't see touched in the paper. The second one is that big shocks lead to big changes in institutions. So what they do in the paper, which is very good as a first pass, is say, look, give me the model, give me these contracts, non-contingent debt, non-contingent labor markets, labor hire in advance, and now I tell you the world changed. Now tail events are very likely. Well, you could have a kind of Lucas critic answer to that and say, well, once we learn that tail events are very likely, we're gonna change the way we do things. Maybe it was costly to have contingent mortgages, but now we start thinking about how to do it. And you know, a lot of what people have been doing here at the ECB and in other similar institutions has been precisely to say, how do we redesign the system in order to make it more resilient next time? So in that regard, perhaps you could interpret the quantitative estimates from the model as an upper bound of the effects that this persistence could have because it is natural to think that uh, you know, the environment would change uh, going forward. Okay, but let me conclude here. As I said, the idea is very natural and intuitive. The exploration, actually the paper is very well done. I'm convinced that if you put this in a quantitative model, it works. I'm less convinced that we see it today in the world and this is where I would uh, you know, like to hear Laura's opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Alberto, for this uh discussion and so now I open the floor 